uh, into just to give you a, uh, an idea of what goes to where. Here's our A440. And then A3 to A220. A5, A80. So it kind of gives you a visualization of, of, of what we were discussing earlier about, you know, how that all works. But here's something to kind of give you a historical perspective. In the French Baroque, in, in France, during the Baroque period, so that would be what century? Does anybody know? Only going young. Um, what we're looking at is actually looking at the 16th, 17th, really the 17th century. Okay, so in the 17th century in France, um, our A440 was originally tuned to A392. A392. So our A was just a little bit higher than a G4. So we were basically tuned about a, a whole step low from where we are today. In general, in the Baroque, they had it at 415, which means that they were tuning it literally in the sound tone lower than where we where we tune it now. And in the classical period, we they had it at 430. 430 makes any modern uh, musician cringe. It's flat. There's no question. It is flat. Period. Done. Um, and then it was actually in the romantic period that we went up to 435 and now 440. You will actually see it is not uncommon for us to actually tune to an A442 or an A444. What we use is we use something called the well-tempered system. So an equal temperament when we tune. And basically, it's a bit of a misnomer because really what we're saying is we're saying that the fifths are going to be really narrow. So like C to G, F to C. D to A, those are going to be really narrow. The thirds, fourths, sixths are going to be wide, and it's going to vary from piano to piano. So just like a person has a, one person has a completely different technique from another, it's the same kind of thing. <coughs> Let's take a closer look at the piano action. Now you see how complex it is. It used to be really simple. Now it has basically what in order to make this work, our key, which extends way over here. Right? So we can look over here. Here's our grand piano. We depress the key. The ribbon pushes the mechanism up. The flange moves. And what happens is that there is a little thing here. So here's our hammer shank. And then here, our jack. Okay? That jack is essentially moving further in. So this goes and then this moves back so that the flange here falls down right after the jack. And if you notice, after we after the hammer goes up, it hits the string and the back check holds it down. Okay? So what we have is a series of levers working in conjunction with each other. Um, and when the reason why I have P equals FT is because what I'm saying is that the, the change in the, the impulse equals force times time. So what are we saying? We're saying that the force of the hammer depends on how hard your key strikes, the, the, how hard your finger strikes the key. So it's actually kind of a misnomer. I mean, or not misnomer, it's kind of a misconception. Because it's not how hard you hit it, it's not with how much weight, it's how fast you hit it. So, but according to this equation, if you strike the key softer, so you're decreasing the force over the same amount of time, this will decrease the impulse. The hammer falls quickly away from the string to avoid stopping the vibration for the simple reason that had we continued holding onto that string, it would have prevented a sustained tone. In terms of technique, what that means is for our, our lever, when we, when we play the piano, we don't want to play way up here. We don't want to play near the near the fall board. Because as we saw, what's going to happen? <coughs> right. It's, it's not going to work as well. It's going to be inefficient usage of energy. So as pianists, we always aim to play as close to the edge as possible. Right? Like when we were all on seesaw. 
want as kids. We always want to be as far back so that we can bump the other person up, right? Once you get to, to the bottom. I guess that wasn't everybody else. Okay. Anyway, maybe that was just me. So, when we're looking at um, technique, we want to be very aware of that. And notice the geography of the hand. The geography of the hand is such that the thumb is in the shortest position. And that is why when we play piano, it is the thumb that determines where we place our fingers, where we place our hand. It is not the other fingers. It is the thumb that rules the rest, okay, when it comes to technique. Now, when we're looking at the soundboard, the soundboard is really important because the soundboard is that thing underneath, that, that piece of wood that allows the vibrations of the string to be heard. Basically, it magnifies the sound of the string. So the strings press down on the bridge, which transfers their vibration to a large, thin piece of wood. And that thin piece of wood, that's what we call the soundboard. And what happens then is the strings resonate by vibrating back and forth, and the wood board, the soundboard, converts these vibrations into sound by moving in and out as the string vibrates. So the soundboard must be able to vibrate in order to produce sound. You cannot have a soundboard that does not accommodate the vibrations of sound. Because it's just going to take that sound and eat it up. So let's pull it all together. A soundboard amplifies sound. It's a big wooden plate that radiates a large volume over a variety of frequencies, and it attaches the strings to the bridge, allowing vibrations to enter the wooden resonator, thereby displacing more air. It's low, and, and when we're looking at the top of the soundboard, okay, there's always a part of the soundboard that's what we call a crown. And that crown is so important because it keeps the, the strings set firmly in the bridge because what happens is that the strings are pre putting pressure downward while the bridge is holding it in place. So that crown doesn't collapse. Very, very important. So then we kind of figure out, okay, so now that we know about sound and we, we, about soundboard and about strings, what creates the tone that we hear? No, it is not a small mouse. It's I, let's talk a little bit about potential energy. Now, potential energy is energy stored in an object. So, due to the downward pull of gravity, gravity ends up giving potential energy to any object. Physics, physicists, is that correct? Am I on the right, right, right? I'm going the right direction. So, as far as Pianists are concerned, when we think of mass, we think of our upper arm. Our upper arm, our forearm, our hands, our fingers. Our mechanism, our body mechanism becomes the mass. And when we're looking at gravity, the acceleration of an object to due to gravity, which is our constant, is about 9.8 meters per second on Earth. So I can't verify the, the, the measurement on Mars or Venus, but I know what for sure what it is on Earth. That's what it is. It's about 9.8 meters. So as this object nears the ground, its potential energy reduces while its kinetic energy increases. You get that opposite effect, right? Potential energy reduces, actual kinetic energy, meaning moving energy, increases. So by changing mass, velocity, meaning speed and height, we can vary the sounds, the tones, and the dynamics. By, um, and then, so like, let's take a look, let's think in terms of slow or moderate tension. When the velocity and height are related in, in that the greater the height, the faster the speed, the sound will be louder. But in faster tempo, where it, when you don't have as much time to lift off your hand, you need to be closer, it's the initial drop that emanates from the sensation of relaxing the shoulder, chest, and back muscles. Has anybody ever done martial arts? A couple of you. Good. There's this um, there's a type of martial art wherein they they relax the arm and basically the arm extends and all of a sudden it's like it goes from arm to mega arm and the way they do it is they just relax the upper body and that's essentially what happens when we play is our back muscles 
Along with the chest muscles, we relax those in order to relax the muscles of the arm and the hand. Um, if we have extreme height and extreme velocity, what ends up happening on the piano is that we get these really brash tones. So, for instance, okay, if I'm going, if I'm taking something slowly,
the formula that I, I sent to Dr. Tori going, please talk about this before I get to it. Basically, what we're looking at, what contributes to good touch, we're looking at four basic elements. We're looking at downweight, upweight, friction, and the action ratio. The downweight is basically the pressure required to press down a key. That part, easily unmovable. We can, we can change how fast you go down. The weight necessary to return the key to the resting position, however, is what we call the upweight. So that's directly related to the hammer weight. Friction is received weight on all joint and moving parts. Too much friction and it feels too heavy. Too little, what's going to happen? If we have too much friction and it's too heavy, if we have too little, how's it going to feel? Too light. Yeah, it's going to be too light, it's going to be too loose. So we want to be very careful about making sure that our actions are always well regulated. Um, and also, if it's too loose, parts could start rattling, all kinds of things could start changing. When we talk about an action ratio, what we're talking about is the lever system. So we're looking at that whipping. This is a whipping, the whipping assembly. Okay? And basically, one gram at the hammer equals five grams on the keyboard. So if that hammer is even slightly heavier. It's going to require a lot more effort, a lot more mass to press it down. So if we look at finger pressure of about 55 grams, that's going to equal our hammers plus our friction. friction. Um, kinetic energy, here we have <coughs> KE standing for kinetic energy, and we have M for mass, V for velocity. And we talked about that already um, in terms of what is mass, but in the case of the piano, mass actually refers to the activated hammer. And velocity refers to the speed of that hammer. Unlike earlier, we are talking about the body. Okay. So, the kinetic energy fluctuates not with the velocity, but with the square of the velocity. So if you alter the velocity or the speed by a given percentage, it results in a larger change in kinetic energy delivered to the string. Basically, seemingly slight changes in the speed of the key descent produces large differences in volume and tone quality. So, let's, let, let's kind of go back a second. So, basically what I've been saying is that it's speed that determines volume and tone quality, not weight. What experiment kind of comes to mind? Well, for me, you remember Galileo? <coughs> and he took two objects that were of different weight, same height, dropped them at the same time. And what happened? Did one fall first? <coughs> no, they landed at the same time, right? So, keep that in mind. Um, Pressing down the key from different heights will generate with different speed or weight, not only generates the same primary pitch, but it also generates various overtones. So that's what kind of gives us that sense of a very widened tonal palette. When we talk about dynamics, earlier Dr. Turi was talking about amplitude. And that's essentially what we're dealing with when we come to the idea of dynamics. For scientists, you think of amplitude. For musicians, we think piano, forte, crescendo, decrescendo, and things that basically, in, in terms of how it all relates to each other. Um, so keep this in mind. Leaves rustling, rustling in the wind, that's about 10 decibels. Jet engine, about 120. So everything else, is somewhere in between there, right? So pianists kind of are in this mode of, of working with sound waves in that when we're, when we're dealing with dynamics, one of you said that there's decay. So when we're, when we're listening for a diminuendo, what we're doing is we're saying, okay, here's our sound wave, it's going like this. Once it hits this point, we're going to play the next note and try to match it on its decay. And it's the matching of the sound waves on the decay that create a sense of diminuendo. However, when we're looking at diminuendo means gradually getting softer. Like when you dim the light, it gets softer. <coughs> Crescendo, increasing the sound, on the other hand, is basically taking, it's like doing pointillistic art. Because what we're doing is we're saying, okay, the height of 
the, the, the highest amplitude of one sound wave might be here, and it decays. But I want to make the next one a little bit higher. So now I'm, I'm going to put in a little, make it a little bit, with a little bit more velocity, so that I could make a higher amplitude for the next sound wave. And the next will be even higher. And so we listen for the relationship of those points, the highest, we listen for the climax of those waves. Um, so let me give you an example. I'm going to play one sound. Now, tell me if I'm doing a crescendo or decrescendo. Perceived. 